good. It's uh, not unusual at Stanford that people come for graduate study after they have already established themselves with distinguished careers. And this is the case uh, for Laura. She is a, a writer, has worked with uh, Wired uh, in interpreting the culture of technology. Uh, she, as John mentioned, has been working on a very interesting research project, uh, an appetite for research and new knowledge, especially interested in how knowledge is shared uh, and she's going to describe the project that she and colleagues worked on in recasting the history textbook. Thank you, Martha. So um, I'm going to walk you through the digital history textbook project. And in that project, we went into um, a school, worked with 94 students to have them take their you know, five, six pound, very traditional printed textbook and have them recast it into chapters that could then be made into a digital textbook. And when I worked in publishing, Frank and I used to work together at Wired, and we'd get all excited about thud factor. Like, that was a good thing. Uh, but now um, I can say, you know, the high school students, they don't like the thud factor. They don't like this in their backpack. Um, so that was one thing the students were worried about. We were more um, concerned about using technology to explore the potential for broadening their historical understanding. And the research team, and I do have to preface, I'm repre representing a much larger uh, group of, of people. I'm going to be highlighting some findings that Molly Bullock, Tanner Vay, and Paul Franz have surfaced in um, kind of November, December time frame. And um, we're going to take a look at why focus in on historical thinking. So, you know, it, it matters for a couple of reasons. First off, the traditional textbook tends to be almost the most notorious example of one-size-fits-all publishing. Um, you know, it, it's, it's big and it's often kind of considered the one voice or the voice of accuracy. This is history and there is one history and, you know, it's in, you know, thousands of pages and this is, this is the authority that's out there. So that's one reason we want to take a look at that. But then also, increasingly, digital authoring tools are being used in classrooms. You know, Esther talked, obviously, they're, they're using some. And um, there's not a lot of research around what value we're getting out of these tools. So we wanted to take a look at, um, you know, what educational value might come out of um, having students create their own content. And then finally, and a part that's actually pretty important to me personally, is I like to work with archivists and librarians. Oftentimes, they have lots of great historical material that they want to get out into the world. They want to get it into the hands of the public. And it's really difficult for them to do that for a lot of different reasons. So part of this project was kind of to explore what were some of those issues and how might we um, work around those. A key um, question of could we leverage the affordances of media creation technologies to engage students in multiple perspective taking and get them to improve their historical thinking skills. And that was um, pretty important. We wanted them to kind of tease out kind of um, almost as foil to that authoritative textbook um, presentation that there might be some other um, perspectives that might be worth kind of teasing out. I'll go back to, to this slide in particular. You know, oftentimes, you know, in these traditional textbooks, and this is the textbooks the kids typically would use, you know, the sidebars have um, kind of the, the, the minor players or what are considered the bit players in history, um, even though that's not necessarily the case. And there's, um, you know, some argument that can be made that, you know, we can tease out more of these seemingly minor peoples in history. So we went into um, a nearby um, charter school, a high-performing charter school, diverse population, and 43% of the students were socioeconomically disadvantaged. We worked with 94 10th grade students. These are students in four different classrooms. They were all studying world history, and they typically worked in pairs, and they pulled together these digital chapters that could then be put together kind of if you will, you know, bound into a, a, a more formal textbook at, at the end of the, the project. And we did this over eight days. That wasn't ideal, but, um, you know, we had initially planned for 
a much longer time frame, but we, um, our project bumped into end of year um, testing. So that took precedence. So we also worked with a couple of key um, research partners. We had an amazing collaborating teacher who was already incorporating historical understanding, multiple perspective taking into his work. And then we worked with archivists from Hoover and the National Archives and Records Administration. Some of you may have driven by them um, off of 280. In those images up there, that's Nick um, Sigirski. He is an archivist with Hoover, and he came into the different classrooms, talked with the students, talked with them on how they can use very formal historical documents in their work and the, and the project, but also how to use some of their own personal um, potential historical records. And um, that was something the students were really um, quite interested in. And we also... Um, pulled together a database of primary source documents. And this was a mix of um, working with some of these big archives that are out in the world, and then also um, pulling in some random actual artifacts and getting them digitized and put online. I can go into a lot of the issues around copyright. Um, Esther talked on them. In general, we were very concerned about copyright. The, the charter school was very concerned about charter or about copyright, the students could care less. Um, that just was not in their realm. Uh, but there's a lot of, um, I think, interesting work to be done in this realm, partly because, um, for instance, the school system that we were in blocked YouTube. A lot of these archives are using YouTube, Vimeo as their platform to get their materials out into the world. It takes some time and money to do that. And then you hit schools where those kids just, um, they can't use those platforms. Now, we were in the classroom for only eight days, but we did for, for the actual digital textbook project, but we were in the classroom on a pretty regular basis doing some scaffolding. You know, one of the biggest issues that we hit, um, whether we're working with digital archival material or not, is just getting the students to learn how to look at these documents and um, kind of pull out the information they need. They really need a lot of practice at analyzing complex historical documents. So we went through um, exercises to get them thinking in terms of sourcing, contextualizing, finding multiple perspectives, um, you know, using primary and secondary sources. Oftentimes it's what's the difference between a primary and a secondary source. And for 10th grade students, that's not a, that's not a, uh, something that necessarily comes easy to them. But we were in the classroom quite a bit and by the time we got to the project, um, the students had a pretty good idea of what we were after. Now, if you take a look at um, the beige block of text, that's what the previous year of students did. So a very, you know, a different group of students, but same teacher, same textbook, same basic curriculum and core standards. And their final project was to kind of take a look at, um, you know, historical documents. On the other side is an example of a student's digital textbook. And so you can see the students are, you know, they're starting to get, you know, some things happening there. There's some um, images. So there's a difference. And of course, the question is, you know, does that difference matter? Do we get any value out of that difference? So in this particular example, this is an iBook author. We used that and, you know, some people, you know, I could talk quite a bit on why we chose that as opposed to another option, but primarily it was free and very easy. Um, I also work with middle schoolers. Anybody can pick up this program. So this is inside the program. Nothing's going to move, but if you touched either of those images that kind of come to life, you're going to see that the student is trying to do some sourcing, some contextualizing. You click on those bottom icons, you're going to see he's trying to draw um, your attention from these larger images down into some really um, kind of old and interesting primary source material. Over to the right are other pages that the student is using. Now in this one, this is, um, I partly use this example because it looks like a much more traditional textbook. And certainly we saw a lot of students take a very traditional approach, okay? Uh, the one element I'll point out is if you actually touch that image over there, you're going to see there's some lines pointing. It does kind of um, come alive, and you're going to see that the student um, is able to like zero in on certain elements of that image 
and pull out the sourcing, talk about the perspectives of the artists and some of the people at that time frame. So if we go back um, kind of to the original research question is, can we leverage the affordances of media creation technologies to kind of engage students in multiple perspective taking and then, you know, greater historical understanding. How far did we get? Um, you know, we, d we did answer this question and um, we were able to say yes, but, and um, the catch is the but um, is actually a pretty significant um, pause. You know, the students absolutely showed evidence of engaging in emerging historical authorship policy practices. So they were doing what they were supposed to. They were, they were sourcing, they were doing a lot of digging, um, but there was really broad variation in which the students use these practices. We need to do a little more digging to see, you know, why. Why did that happen? Um, often, you know, these were students who were generally on par with one another, but there was really significant variation. Um, was it the technology we were using? Was it the fact that a lot of these students actually hadn't used Macintosh computers before? Something we didn't necessarily expect coming into the classroom. Um, and then what also emerged was the unexpected use of very traditional textbook features. After all this scaffolding we did, after all this time of saying, you know, what's your student alternative to this? You know, like get those multiple perspectives out here. Most of the students, um, they did what they were supposed to, but they still wanted to ape the very traditional textbook. And um, I think that's where we're, we're gonna um, kind of zero in going forward. Now, just in case I've got teachers who are, are gonna be very curious, well, if I were to do this, what are some of the real practical things? You know, with the most sophisticated students um, or the work, we saw that they were posing their own original inquiry questions. So they were taking a lot of times to come, a lot of time to come up with very specific questions that mattered to them. They weren't using um, the larger content um, standard questions that might have been available to them or in their book. Uh, they were also using very small, um, easily analyzed um, documents and word-based documents. Students who went for broader questions or who went for photos or visuals actually had a really tough time, um, you know, kind of making historical sense. Now, going forward, um, we've got hundreds of pages of these textbooks. So we're going to go back into some of what we already have. We're going to take a look at um, more specifically, their use of primary and secondary sources. We're also going to look at moral judgment and empathy or look for instances of those. We're also going to look for elite and non-elite pers perspectives. And then um, really look back at the trope of authoritative you know, textbook. What is it about our authoritative textbooks that even when you're told don't, don't do that, it's still hard to resist? Okay, so thank you.